Understand by Ted Chang. Part three. I pause in my work. Before I develop a notation for aesthetics, I must establish a vocabulary for all the emotions I can imagine. I'm aware of many emotions beyond those of normal humans. I see how limited their effective range is. I don't deny the validity of the love and angst I once felt, but I do see them for what they were. Like the infatuations and depressions of childhood, they were just the forerunners of what I experience now. My passions now are more multifaceted. As self-knowledge increases, all emotions become exponentially more complex. I must be able to describe them fully if I am to even attempt the composing tasks ahead. Of course, I actually experience far fewer emotions than I could. My development is limited by the intelligence of those around me and the scant intercourse I permit myself with them. I am reminded of the Confucian concept of run, inadequately conveyed by benevolence, that quality which is quintessentially human, which can only be cultivated through interaction with others and which a solitary person cannot manifest. It's one of many such qualities. And here am I with people, people everywhere, yet not a one to interact with. I'm only a fraction of what a complete individual with my intelligence could be. I don't delude myself with either self-pity or conceit. I can evaluate my own psychological state with the utmost objectivity and consistency. I know precisely which emotional resources I have and which I lack, and how much value I place on each. I have no regrets. My new language is taking shape. It is gestalt-oriented, rendering it beautifully suited for thought, but impractical for writing or speech. It wouldn't be transcribed in the form of words arranged linearly, but as a giant ideogram to be absorbed as a whole. Such an ideogram could convey more deliberately than a picture what a thousand words cannot. The intricacy of each ideogram would be commensurate with the amount of information contained. I amuse myself with the notion of a colossal ideogram that describes the entire universe. The printed page is too clumsy and static for this language. The only serviceable media would be video or hollow, displaying a time-evolving graphic image. Speaking this language would be out of the question, given the limited bandwidth of the human larynx. My mind seethes with expletives from ancient and modern languages, and they taunt me with their crudeness, reminding me that my ideal language would offer terms with sufficient venom to express my present frustration. I cannot complete my artificial language. It's too large a project for my present tools. Weeks of concentrated effort have yielded nothing usable. I've attempted to write it via bootstrapping, by employing the rudimentary language that I've already defined to rewrite the language and produce successively fuller versions. Yet each new version only highlights its own inadequacies, forcing me to expand my ultimate goal, condemning it to the status of a holy grail at the end of a divergent infinite regress. This is no better than trying to create it ex nihilo. What about my fourth ampule? I can't remove it from my thoughts. Every frustration I experience at my present plateau reminds me of the possibility for still greater heights. Of course, there are significant risks. This injection might be the one that causes brain damage or insanity. Temptation by the devil, perhaps, but temptation nonetheless. I find no reason to resist. I'd have a margin of safety if I injected myself in a hospital or, failing that, with someone standing by in my apartment. However, 
I imagine the injection will either be successful or else cause irreparable damage, so I forego those precautions. I order equipment from a medical supply company and assemble an apparatus for administering the spinal injection by myself. It may take days for the full effects to become evident, so I'll confine myself to my bedroom. It's possible that my reaction will be violent. I remove breakables from the room and attach loose straps to the bed. The neighbors will interpret anything they hear as an addict howling. I inject myself and wait. My brain is on fire. My spine burns itself through my back. I feel near apoplexy. I am blind, deaf, insensate. I hallucinate. Seen with such preternatural clarity and contrast that they must be illusory, unspeakable horrors loom all around me. Scenes not of physical violence, but of psychic mutilation. Mental agony and orgasm. Terror and hysterical laughter. For a brief moment, perception returns. I'm on the floor, hands clenched in my hair, some uprooted tufts lying around me. My clothes are soaked in sweat. I've bitten my tongue and my throat is raw. From screaming, I surmise. Convulsions have left my body badly bruised, and a concussion is likely given the contusions on the back of my head. But I feel nothing. Has it been hours or moments? Then my vision clouds and the roar returns. Critical mass. Revelation. I understand the mechanics of my own thinking. I know precisely how I know, and my understanding is recursive. I understand the infinite regress of this self-knowing, not by proceeding step by step endlessly, but by apprehending the limit. The nature of recursive cognition is clear to me. A new meaning of the term self-aware. Fiat logos. I know my mind in terms of a language more expressive than any I'd previously imagined. Like God creating order from chaos with an utterance, I make myself anew with this language. It is meta-self-descriptive and self-editing. Not only can it describe thought, it can describe and modify its own operations as well at all levels. What girdle would have given to see this language, where modifying a statement causes the entire grammar to be adjusted? With this language, I can see how my mind is operating. I don't pretend to see my own neurons firing. Such claims belong to John Lilly and his LSD experiments of the 60s. What I can do is perceive the gestalts. I see the mental structures forming, interacting. I see myself thinking. And I see the equations that describe my thinking and I see myself comprehending the equations, and I see how the equations describe their being comprehended. I know how they make up my thoughts. These thoughts. Initially I am overwhelmed by all this input, paralyzed with awareness of myself, it is hours before I can control the flood of self-describing information. I haven't filtered it away, nor pushed it into the background. It's become integrated into my mental processes for use during my normal activities. It will be longer before I can take advantage of it, effortlessly and effectively, the way a dancer uses her kinesthetic knowledge. All that I once knew theoretically about my mind I now see detailed explicitly. The undercurrents of sex, aggression and self-preservation, translated by the conditioning of my childhood, clash with and are sometimes disguised as rational thought. I recognize all the causes of my every mood, 
the motives behind my every decision. What can I do with this knowledge? Much of what is conventionally described as personality is at my discretion. The higher level aspects of my psyche define who I am now. I can send my mind into a variety of mental or emotional states, yet remain ever aware of the state and able to restore my original condition. Now that I understand the mechanisms that were operating when I attended to two tasks at once, I can divide my consciousness, simultaneously devoting almost full concentration and gestalt recognition abilities to two or more separate problems, meta-aware of all of them. What can't I do? I know my body afresh, as if it were an amputee stump suddenly replaced by a watchmaker's hand. Controlling my voluntary muscles is trivial. I have inhuman coordination. Skills that normally require thousands of repetitions to develop, I can learn in two or three. I find a video with a shot of a pianist's hands playing, and before long I can duplicate his finger movements without a keyboard in front of me. Selective contraction and relaxation of muscles improve my strength and flexibility. Muscular response time is 35 milliseconds for conscious or reflex action. Learning acrobatics and martial arts would require little training. I have somatic awareness of kidney function, nutrient absorption, glandular secretions. I am even conscious of the role that neurotransmitters play in my thoughts. This state of consciousness involves mental activity more intense than in any epinephrine-boosted stress situation. Part of my mind is maintaining a condition that would kill a normal mind and body within minutes. As I adjust the programming of my mind, I experience the ebb and flow of all the substances that trigger my emotional reactions, boost my attention, or subtly shape my attitudes. And then I look outward. Blinding, joyous, fearful symmetry surrounds me. So much is incorporated within patterns now that the entire universe verges on resolving itself into a picture. I'm closing in on the ultimate gestalt, the context in which all knowledge fits and is illuminated, a mandala, the music of the spheres, cosmos. I seek enlightenment, not spiritual, but rational. I must go still further to reach it, but this time the goal will not be perpetually retreating from my fingertips. With my mind's language, the distance between myself and enlightenment is precisely calculable. I've sighted my final destination. Now I must plan my next actions. First, there are the simple enhancements to self-preservation, starting with martial arts training. I will watch some tournaments to study possible attacks, though I will take only defensive action. I can move rapidly enough to avoid contact with even the fastest striking techniques. This will let me protect myself and disarm any street criminals should I be assaulted. Meanwhile, I must eat copious amounts of food to meet my brain's nourishment requirements, even given increased efficiency in my metabolism. I shall also shave my scalp to allow greater radiative cooling for the heightened blood flow to my head. Then there is the primary goal, decoding those patterns. For further improvements to my mind, artificial enhancements are the only possibility. A direct computer mind link, permitting mind downloading, is what I need, but I must create a new technology to implement it. Anything based on digital computation will be inadequate. What I have in mind requires nanoscale structures based on neural networks. Once I have the basic ideas laid out, 
I set my mind to multi-processing, one section of my mind deriving a branch of mathematics that reflects the network's behavior, another developing a process for replicating the formation of neural pathways on a molecular scale in a self-repairing bioceramic medium. A third, devising tactics for guiding private industrial R&D to produce what I'll need. I cannot waste time. I will introduce explosive theoretical and technical breakthroughs so that my new industry will hit the ground running. I've gone into the outside world to reobserve society. The sign language of emotion I once knew has been replaced by a matrix of interrelated equations. Lines of force twist and elongate between people, objects, institutions, ideas. The individuals are tragically like marionettes, independently animate, but bound by a web they choose not to see. They could resist if they wished, but so few of them do. At the moment, I'm sitting at a bar. Three stools to my right sits a man familiar with this type of establishment who looks around and notices a couple in a dark corner booth. He smiles, motions for the bartender to come over, and leads forward to speak confidentially about the couple. I don't need to listen to know what he's saying. He's lying to the bartender, easily, extemporaneously. A compulsive liar not out of a desire for a life more exciting than his own, but to revel in his facility for deceiving others. He knows the bartender is detached, merely affecting interest, which is true. But he knows the bartender is still fooled, which is also true. My sensitivity to the body language of others has increased to the point that I can make these observations without sight or sound. I can smell the pheromones exuded by his skin. To an extent, my muscles can even detect the tension within his, perhaps by their electric field. These channels can't convey precise information, but the impressions I receive provide ample basis for extrapolation. They add texture to the web. Normal humans may detect these emanations subliminally. I'll work on becoming more attuned to them then perhaps I can try consciously controlling my own expressions. I've developed abilities reminiscent of the mind control schemes offered by tabloid advertisements. My control over my somatic emanations now lets me provoke precise reactions in others. With pheromones and muscle tension, I can cause another person to respond with anger, fear, sympathy, or sexual arousal certainly enough to win friends and influence people. I can even induce a self-sustaining reaction in others. By associating a particular response with a sense of satisfaction, I can create a positive reinforcement loop, like biofeedback. The person's body will strengthen the reaction on its own. I'll use this on corporate presidents to create support for the industries I'll need. I can no longer dream in any normal sense. I lack anything that would qualify as a subconscious, and I control all the maintenance functions performed by my brain, so normal REM sleep tasks are obsolete. There are moments when my grasp on my mind slips, but they cannot be called dreams. Meta-hallucinations, perhaps. Sheer torture. These are periods during which I'm detached. I understand how my mind generates the strange visions, but I'm paralyzed and unable to respond. I can scarcely identify what I see. Images of bizarre transfinite self-references and modifications that even I find nonsensical. My mind is taxing the resources of my brain. 
a biological structure of this size and complexity can just barely sustain a self-knowing psyche. But the self-knowing psyche is also self-regulating to an extent. I give my mind full use of what's available and restrain it from expanding beyond that. But it's difficult. I'm cramped inside a bamboo cage that doesn't let me sit down or stand up. If I try to relax or try to extend myself fully, then agony. Madness. I'm hallucinating. I see my mind imagining possible configurations it could assume and then collapsing. I witness my own delusions, my visions of what form my mind might take when I grasp the ultimate gestalts. Will I achieve ultimate self-awareness? Could I discover the components that make up my own mental gestalts? Would I penetrate racial memory? Would I find innate knowledge of morality? I might determine whether mind could be spontaneously generated from matter and understand what relates consciousness with the rest of the universe. I might see how to merge subject and object, the zero experience. Or perhaps I'd find that the mind gestalt cannot be generated and some sort of intervention is required. Perhaps I would see the soul the ingredient of consciousness that surpasses physicality. Proof of God? I would behold the meaning, the true character of existence. I would be enlightened. It must be euphoric to experience. My mind collapses back into a state of sanity. I must keep a tighter rein over myself. When I'm in control at the metaprogramming level, my mind is perfectly self-repairing. I could restore myself from states that resemble delusion or amnesia. But if I drift too far on the metaprogramming level, my mind might become an unstable structure, and then I would slide into a state beyond mere insanity. I will program my mind to forbid itself from moving beyond its own reprogramming range. These hallucinations strengthen my resolve to create an artificial brain. Only with such a structure will I be able to actually perceive those gestalts instead of merely dreaming about them. To achieve enlightenment, I'll need to exceed another critical mass in terms of neuronal analogs. I open my eyes. It's two hours, twenty-eight minutes, and ten seconds since I close my eyes to rest though not to sleep. I rise from bed. I request a listing of my stock's performance on my terminal. I look down the flat screen and freeze. The screen shouts at me. It tells me that there is another person with an enhanced mind. Five of my investments have demonstrated losses. They're not precipitous, but large enough that I'd have detected them in the body language of the stockbrokers. Reading down the alphabetical list, the initial letters of the corporations whose stock values have dropped are C, E, G, O, and R, which, when rearranged, spell Greco. Someone is sending me a message. There's someone else out there like me. There must have been another comatose patient who received a third injection of Hormone K. He erased his file from the FDA database before I accessed it and supplied false input to his doctor's account so that they wouldn't notice. He too stole another ampule of the hormone, contributing to the FDA's closing of their files and with his whereabouts unknown to the authorities, he's reached my level. He must have recognized me through the investment patterns of my false identities. He'd have to have been supercritical to do that. As an enhanced individual, he could have affected sudden and precise changes to trigger my losses and attract my attention. I check various data services for stock quotes. The entries on my listing are correct, so my counterpart didn't simply edit the values for my account alone. 
he altered the selling patterns of the stock of five unrelated corporations for the sake of a word. It makes for quite a demonstration. I consider it no mean feat. Presumably his treatment began before mine did, meaning that he is farther along than I. But by how much? I begin extrapolating his likely progress. I will incorporate new information as I acquire it. The critical question, is he friend or foe? Was this merely a good-natured demonstration of his power or an indication of his intent to ruin me? The amounts I lost were moderate. Does this indicate concern for me or for the corporations which he had to manipulate? Given all the harmless ways he could have attracted my attention, I must assume that he is to some degree hostile. In which case, I am at risk, vulnerable to anything from another prank to a fatal attack. As a precaution, I will leave immediately. Obviously, if he were actively hostile, I'd be dead already.